Welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations. My name is Victor Trinidad with NCPMI. This webinar is part of the Within the Framework webinar series, and today's topic is Inclusive Routines in Early Care and Learning Inclusive Routines, presented by Jackie Joseph, Megan Cartwright, Alyssa Rausch, and Phil Strain. Thank you very much, and please proceed. Good morning, everyone if you're in a morning time zone and good afternoon to the rest of you. In our first uh, webinar in this series two weeks ago, uh, we talked about the results of a study where we were curious as to how it was that some inclusionary programs uh, were able to maintain high levels of intervention fidelity for as much as two decades. And one of the things that we found in that research was that there were a number of characteristics or dispositions, if you will, of their leaders that really distinguished those programs that had successfully navigated 20 years or more of high fidelity inclusion in childcare settings and Head Start and in public pre-K. And as we did last week, I want to just pick out a couple of these characteristics that are enumerated on our first slide, and we'll leave that slide up for a while while we, while we chat. But I wanted uh, Jackie, who is the lead administrator of, of the RISE School, to respond to a couple of these characteristics and give you some feel for how that might have played out in her journey as the director of RISE School. So, so let's take this first characteristic. One of the things that we found is that these leaders were doing inclusion, not because somebody told them to, or that it was some sort of requirement or, or, or any external, really uh, influence. It was their own personal sense of right and wrong, a certain sense of this is a moral and ethical question for me, and this is where I've come down on that. Uh, Jackie, could you help us understand a little bit more about that as you experience things like that? For sure. Um... So I think the way that we've even started in or framing inclusion here at RISE is more of a social justice issue, a right to be affirmed and included in your communities um, with everyone else. And um, it's inclusion and implementing inclusion a lot like in the beginning just like you said moral and ethical I remember we used to like we we have these different mantras or phrases that we continually say you know over time and one of the ones that we would just remind ourselves in the beginning when people were learning new practices and implementing new things or maybe doing more work here than than they might have done other places or I guess not more work but in a seemingly way. more work in a different way because another thing we always say is like you're doing the work either way one's just leading you to inclusion another one's just making you have wine nights <laughs> more often I don't know um I just said that because one of our external therapists who was leaving and I just heard her say that outside the door <laughs> um but one thing that we said a lot in the beginning was um, our, this is our ethical obligation. We would remind ourselves, yes, this might be hard. Yes, this might feel different. Yes, this might mean changing this routine or the way that we do things. And this is our ethical obligation. And another way that we've started thinking about it is in the framework of belonging. So it's actually not just our, our ethical obligation to provide access or necessarily to just provide high quality inclusion. It is to ensure that in our places um, or at RISE that all of us as staff and all of us, all of the children who we educate and care for and all of our families truly belong at RISE. And what we've learned is that 
implementing and scaling up and sustaining inclusion here really became about getting all of us uh, to be working toward this common mission to really care for and promote that every child is truly belonging. So it's not just opportunities to kind of superficially play with friends. It's it's how do we know that they belong? When my daughter, I'll use her for example, her, her name's Juniper, when she's in her classroom and her friends want to play with her, they know how to play with her and they play with her in an independent capacity where there's not necessarily an adult um, telling her that she had that, that they have to or, or how to. And of course we teach that systematically and reinforce it and promote it over time. But our end goal is that true sense of belonging where true friendships are formed. And it's that for every member of our community. Well, thank you, Jackie. I, I, I appreciate that very much. Um, I expect other people on the call do as well. Um, what, one of the other uh, characteristics uh, uh, that, uh, that folks were really clear about is that uh, when, they, when they went from um, non-inclusionary services, and they all had this history, they went from non-inclusionary services to inclusionary services. And um, one of the fears that they had was that this is going to be such a slog. You know, we're going to be hammered constantly by people not wanting to do this or whatever form of resistance. Um, but but they were all really clear um, in talking to us that hey, we're not saints. Uh, we were encouraged every day of our journey in inclusion. We were encouraged by daily stories of success. We were in particular encouraged by uh, adult family members who in many cases, it was the first time their children were, let's just put it in your terms, Jackie, in a place of belonging. Um, does that ring true in terms of your experience at, at RISE? For sure. Um, I think um, one of the things Megan talks about a lot is her favorite moment when, um, for example, staff, you can kind of see when it all clicks in for them. And, and when they start to share all of the stories about how all of their hard work is is really paying off and making such a difference not only for the kids in the classroom but for the adults who work in the classroom and for their families um i mean we get stories every single day that just thinking about them i just feel like emotion and could cry we're also working into one of our biggest fundraisers of the year so we're getting an influx of those stories um right now but one that comes immediately to mind that I, I think about a lot is like how those circles grow. And so one of the moms who um, comes to rise, she's gotten a lot of her family and her friends involved. And we invited one of her friends to join a meeting or something the other day. And, and someone said, you know, why rise? Like, why do you care about rise? And he said, because I know that when they got their daughter's diagnosis, rise was what saved them um, knowing that they didn't have to have lowered expectations or worry that their daughter was only going to be friends with her sister or the members of her family um, and that they would be part of a bigger community who cares about um, kids with and without disabilities as much as they do um, we're and, and we have a, a crushed it wall where we talk about things that staff have done that's amazing, but also like amazing goals that have happened. Like this week, a, a little girl, um, because her friends have been doing different activities with her, like sat up um, for the first for the first time when the doctors in the beginning told her that they didn't know that that was going to happen, and um, we just have the opportunity to really be encouraged that what we do is so important and is impactful as it is because it's inclusive all the time. Can I add to that? Please do, Megan. Uh, we actually just this morning had an alumni family that uh, returned back to school and the mom was sharing with me that 
you know, it was their first day off from kindergarten. And the first thing that this child wanted to do was come back to rise today. And it was really just reaffirming, like, that's right. That's why we do the things that we do. And we put in the work and we drive each other to continue to improve is because this is what our families and our children deserve. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much for, for launching us uh, into today's content. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alyssa Rausch, who is suffering uh, <laughs> vocally, uh, but otherwise is just fine. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Phil and Jackie and Megan, I, I hate following you all after you talk so eloquently about what it is that you do, but we do want to frame some of what Jackie and Megan are going to talk about in this webinar in some of the things we know about leadership and um, and how they have really brought the, these elements to life. So there's three things we want to cover today. Um, the first is um, Jackie and Megan probably wouldn't describe themselves um, in these theoretical frameworks, but I think as you see their work come to life um, and they talk about it, that you'll see where all of these different um, practices and leadership strategies are relevant in their work. So um, the first one is leading by convening. And um, in the in the past two webinars, we've talked a lot about a lot of these things that they've done. But what we've seen is examples of um, these three items in this circle. <clears throat> the first is coalescing around issues, right? Jackie and Megan have talked about bringing their staff and their families and their community into talking about what's relevant at RISE. They've also ensured that that participation matters, right? They're, they're listening to those voices and the outcomes that they're seeing and what they're doing matters. And then also that they're doing the work together. So they talked a lot about that last week when, um, when Megan described being in the dugout together, right? And really working um, from that space of, um, <clears throat> of being uh, together in, the, in, those, in those teams. We see here that those that these habits of interaction and leading by convening are also um, they're, they're also into they're also defined into some elements of interaction as well as some depths of interaction. I want to talk a little bit about the elements of interaction because this is something that we see come up in our work again and Jackie and Megan and the Rise School and um, other child care um, organizations and community based organizations who support children with disabilities do this well also. Um, some of the things that we like to talk about are is understanding the different the difference between technical and adaptive challenges. Um, this comes from our colleagues um, Blase Fix and Sims and Ward, um, who are experts in implementation science. And they talk about those technical challenges as those challenges that we understand what the problem is, and we know that there are known solutions to the problem. So technical challenges um, tend to have an agreed upon solution about where what, what needs to happen. Um, technical challenges can be challenging. Karen Blase once reminded me that putting a man on the moon is indeed a technical challenge. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. It requires a lot of steps and a lot of thinking, but it's a technical challenge. Those adaptive challenges tend to have um, more of a value sense or a belief or driven basis. Um, sometimes the way that you address them are a little less certain. There's multiple paths that you could take to get somewhere and that it might be more likely that a team would be less likely to agree on what the challenges, is, challenges are. And we often think about these when we talk about equity. So to hear Jackie and Megan talk about social justice as a huge part of their work, um, we, we know that they engage in both understanding technical challenges as well as adaptive challenges in their leadership. So this, this um, is also from um, our colleagues at NERN, and this is such a great um, example of leadership, but we know that those things <clears throat> that are technical challenges, we're close to agreement on what they are, and we're also close to agreement on what we think the solutions for those are. So we see those in, those, in that corner around simple, um, in where, those, where the axes meet up. We also see that sometimes those can be complicated. For example, putting, putting someone on the moon can be a challenge. 
Um, but we are close to agreement in how that could happen. And we also think we can do it. Whereas those adaptive challenges live in that zone of complexity, that red zone where really we're far from agreement on what those challenges are, as well as far from certainty around how we're gonna solve those challenges. And I think that um, Jackie and Megan navigate these adaptive challenges really well. And um, that's one of the major pieces that has made RISE as successful with implementing inclusion as they have been. Finally, we're gonna take you back to this, um, it, to, to this graphic that we use a lot um, around implementation and improvement science. And Jackie has one of my new favorite quotes um, around implementation and practices. And I'm gonna let her share that because that's on an upcoming slide. Um, but, uh, but these implementation and improvement science sort of conversations are around what are those practices that we talked about in the first webinar? Um, making those happen is one thing, right? Making sure that routines to the third power is there, making sure that those um, collaborative um, teaming opportunities are there is really important. But then all those other implementation pieces around what are the policies and procedures, what are the schedules, what are the ways in which we support communication, that those implementation pieces are so important as well. So um, as Jackie and Megan continue to talk today, well, they'll share a lot about what does it mean to bring practices forward, but then also what does it mean to build an implementation structure? Jackie and Megan, you're up. We're up. Thank you so much, um, Alyssa. This first slide is just, um, I wanted to also like further couch, um, couch root, a little ground, a little bit more of what we'll be talking about today um, in a reminder that, um, that these amazing resources exist. And I love what you said, Alyssa, because um, a systematic approach to inclusion is necessary for it to happen. Like I think oftentimes people focus, um, I, I don't, I think many people maybe, or we might think about inclusion happening in the classroom, right? But it's made possible, it launches, it scales up, it sustains because there are systems in place to support it to happen and to do those things in the classroom. And so, um, Today we'll be talking, you know, a bit about some local program indicators um, in terms of like the system program level that that we obviously are are implementing inclusion. But um, knowing that these indicators exist for state and local and community and early care and learning environments um, is really helpful to see all of those different levels that that impact one another. Um, and create challenges and offer opportunities for solutions. And we really do um, incorporate uh, particularly the local and uh, early childhood um, classroom level indicators into what we do and ensure fidelity um, of that as well. So I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to when they see some of those screenshots that the, that's where they come from um, out of the, the center um, that we're obviously so lucky to do this webinar with um, and also the ECTA center. So um, just you know, an emphasizing of the program is pivotal for high quality inclusion to occur. Um, ensuring that we're making really good decisions at a programmatic level to ensure that ourselves, our programs, our people, our kids and families are all able to thrive, right? And these are just some of the things that I think we've identified um, have really uh, helped us and they are grounded in a lot of what those indicators say um, as well. So we enroll children with disabilities while maintaining high quality inclusion ratios. Um, at RISE, we, um, we enroll children uh, with disabilities with a wide range of uh, abilities uh, within their diagnosis. We're oftentimes one of the only places, um, especially as children are younger or, or their family chooses or needs to be in an early care, um, setting who will provide opportunities for young children with more um, significant or extensive support needs, rare genetic syndromes, um, like my daughter, uh, to be included. 
Um, we get stories a lot um, about how some of our children, you know, if they're not yet potty trained um, are two or three, but they would be required to be in an infant classroom or something like that. Um, and so I just wanted to let, um, to mention that when I talk about this ratio in a minute, um, it's also, um, it's research supported, uh, but, but it's also enables us to give a place to belong to kids who uh, other places maybe um, aren't doing that yet. And so for every child with a disability, we enroll at RISE, we enroll two to three young children without a disability. Um, Phil talks about this a lot that, um, and RISE has historically done a 50-50 model of inclusion, but we know that when we implement what we refer to as an evidence-based uh, ratio of inclusion, it not only supports the children to be successful, it also supports um, you know, staff to be successful and families to be successful because then our team can provide them more individualized support and collaboration um, that they need around the processes that we have in place for supporting kids with disabilities. So um, time to learn, to meet, to plan, to collaborate, to partner with families. Um, this webinar focuses on childcare and, and we don't oftentimes have planning time or we're trying to fit in meetings um, before and after school, but anything that leaders can do to um, to creatively solve those time issues really does promote collab as we talked so much about last time uh, collaboration needs to happen for inclusion to occur right uh, data we collect tons of data from the program to the classroom to the team to the child level um, we collect it very strategically we never collect data that aren't um, directly being used in some fashion uh, to make decisions, to ensure that what we're doing is successful, to ensure that everybody is supported and that teaming um, and more systemic structures um, are in place. So um, like at the program level, we'll, we'll look at family engagement, um, ratios, where our kids are going after, after, as they transition into kindergarten. At the classroom, we measure the quality of inclusion using the QPI from LEAP and also the, the indicators that we just that we just showed at the team level, staff engagement, success in coaching, um, and then at the child level, you know, screening, assessment, are they reaching individual goals? Are they making reciprocal, authentic friendships? And we use all of that information to guide some form of what we do to be inclusive. Um, we have control over team member retention. When, um, when I started, we had a pretty high turnover rate. Um, and I am not taking credit for this at all, but because we thought of because we looked at inclusion systematically and we figured out what are the actual pain points that, that staff are leaving, this year we had 100% of our staff return to rise um, after two really, really hard years uh, because we took that very, um, a more broad perspective about what really matters to our staff and how we can support them to change. A teaming structure and model that works for everybody, um, support, uh, a comprehensive inclusive framework. So we um, have talked before about how we partner with the Pele Center and we receive coaching on the LEAP model and we're really implementing, um, you know, all of the inclusion indicators uh, or working towards scaling them up all comprehensively, um, which I think really does help because they, they especially start to complement one another and build on one another the more that that you're doing and the closer you're getting to implementing inclusion with fidelity, meaningful professional development, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, and then focusing on what we do have the ability to do. We always talk about being strengths-based. We're a tiny, scrappy nonprofit. We raise multiple, you know, um, we, we, we work to keep a very low tuition rate. So we do raise a considerable amount of money each year um, and to offer scholarships and things like that. Um, we can't do everything, you know, and but but we focus on what we do have the ability to do and we keep the fact that we want to be the most high quality inclusive childcare center um, in the world. 
<laughs> uh, at the forefront of everything we do, and we make strategic choices to get us there. Um, as you see, you know, having a vision, having awareness and commitment to it is a huge part of this. I think we have some, like we had some form of, of an advantage here because we're a nonprofit and, and because RISE was started historically by families who wanted their children with disabilities to be included. So inclusion in theory has always been our mission. Um, but when we really recommitted to inclusion um, two years ago, we really took our mission and then we were we refined in terms of what is that image? What do we actually want to see happening, right? We want to see our kids belonging, right? Thriving, maximizing their potential. And then we talked about then that's our goal. Then what does that look like? How are we going to get there in terms of our achievable um, objectives and what it, what are the values that we are going to have and hold that are going to carry us there? We get lots of opportunities to do different amazing things. And sometimes we have to say no if they will take us, if they will take staff capacity away to work into this mission, um, even when we really, really want to do them because we have limited resources, because we have limited time, because we have limited people, we have to stay very focused on our goals and our, our mission and vision for where we want to be. And Alyssa, I think this is what you were talking about when you were referring to your new favorite phrase. Um, Jackie came up with that culture eats practice for breakfast. Um, and really just kind of building off of what Jackie said, inclusion doesn't just happen um, because we put students who are considered typically developing um, in a classroom of students with disabilities. And so um, it really takes a whole system approach in order um, to make inclusion truly, true inclusion really possible. Um, and as Jackie had mentioned, really the mission, um, the vision, the values and goals are really just this North Star or this guiding light in all of our decision making. Um, it's helped develop some of the phrases that Jackie mentioned at the very beginning, like the, you know, we have an ethical obligation to do this or yes, this is challenging. Um, but we can make it happen or it's what needs to happen. Um, and then ultimately we, we can do hard things which we've, we've been able to um, see happen time and time again and is really reinforcing in itself that we really can do these hard things. Um, and as Jackie mentioned, sometimes this guiding light does guide us towards saying no to certain things um, if it is gonna take us away from our, our mission, our, our vision, our values and our goals. Um, we actually, Jackie and I were just talking this week about um, really scaling up one of our classrooms outside routines and really um, offering more structure during this time and came to the realization that this might impact some of our scores on various environmental assessments um, because they may not be looking at inclusion as comprehensively as we are. Um, and we both said that, that that's a hill we're willing to die on. Um, we know that we are taking the means to ensure um, that every child is engaged in meaningful play with friends. And in order to do that, we had to scale up our routines and, and really define you know, what is this, what's considered free play and what's considered free for all. Um, and, and knowing that it's our ethical obligation, we, we chose to, to kind of take the hit on that assessment. Um, and part of co-creating this inclusive culture also means that not only are we doing everything we can to support the students in our classroom, but also that we're continuing to support each other um, to grow in, in all, all aspects. And so we um, met at the beginning of this year and created our accountability buddies and, and worked together to create these resilience plans, knowing that we are doing doing these hard things. How is it that we can work as a team um, and hold each other accountable for um, self-care or really resilience um, to the things that we're doing? So um, 
and I think we hear this one a lot about really leading by example. And, and I, I think it's something that's easy to say and a little bit harder to do. At least that's what I'm finding out from mm -hmm. my experience. Um, but it really has forced us to really jump in, not forced, that's, that's the wrong word, but um, really pitching in to make sure that everyone is helping each other. And I think we spent a lot of time um, when Jackie first came on and defining what are our roles and responsibilities. And I think we've really come to this beautiful moment this year specifically in terms of, well, we're really just living in this gray area and everyone is willing to pitch in and help out and do the things that, that we need to do in order to make inclusion work however we can. Um, the other thing um, that I do want us to think about is really our relationships with families are one of the things we do consistently think about are our relationships with families and um, this reciprocal relationship that we've created. So we are constantly asking ourselves in meetings, um, you know, is this a family of the, or is this a priority of the family? Is this something that they really wanna focus on right now? And sometimes the families um, may not wanna focus on something that we deem really important and being able to, to honor that. And I think that um, these reciprocal relationships have allowed us to just feel um, more supported. Like there was an example last year, I think we, we really hit a tough point in terms of we had teachers out with COVID and um, we were just having a tough go of it and really, you know, being our scrappy selves and, and combining classrooms and doing things that we needed to do in order to get through. And the families really showed up for all the teachers and brought in really special things for us and um, really helped us feel loved and supported. And so it, it really was a two-way street um, that we feel really lucky to have. So um, another example, um, we, <laughs> we really want to make sure that we are coaching teams plan and embed high quality inclusion. And I think that I am working and continuously reflecting on how can I differentiate my coaching strategies um, to best help all of our teachers. And so sometimes that might simply mean making an action plan um, and saying, you know, here are the items that we need to do. But for some other teachers, that might only get us to inclusion at the surface level. And really, it could be a matter of the teacher and I working to together to focus on one specific routine um, and really kind of see how that routine supports the students and how all students really feel a sense of belonging during that specific portion of the day. Um, and then eventually fade myself out on that. So really being able to differentiate those coaching conversations. And, and I think both of our goals are anytime that we're really connecting with teachers and having those coaching opportunities is making sure that when we leave that conversation, we answer the question, um, do our teachers feel safe and supported to be able to do their best? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think this is me, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think another thing, I don't think, I don't know why I keep saying it, I think. Uh, <laughs> another thing uh, that we've really incorporated into our framework of how to do this at, at more of a programmatic leadership level is this concept of psychological safety. And I actually, as I was looking into it, when I first started reading about it, um, there's there's a, a NERN um, webinar where they talk about implementation science and psychological safety. That's um, really interesting as well. And so psychological safety is this belief by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking, that you're not going to be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas or questions or concerns or mistakes. And I think back to Megan has vulnerably shared, um, we're oftentimes talking about, um, oh, let me do that again. You know, <laughs> yeah, let's redo that. Um, I made the best decision that I could um, with as much feedback as I did at that time. It seems like it's not working for everybody. So let's let's do something different or um, or figure this out together. And um, what one thing that we've realized is that a lot of practitioners, um, we support a lot of 
team members who are freshly out of their programs and um, helping them to know that nobody is fully prepared to do really great inclusion in our programs. And that's why, um, and that that shouldn't even be like the expectation, right? And and not that they're not like fully prepared, like th that's not any comment about a quality of a program or anything like that. It's just a reminder to all of us that like, we don't stop learning um, when we get our degrees, right? And and learning is vulnerable and, and difficult and creating this climate where you can say, I don't actually know the answer to that. And we've even given permission to one another to say like, I really don't even need to make to be involved in making that decision or knowing that and that's okay too because I am at full capacity and what I can do it's like the growth mindset the lifelong learning and then the the safety um to to do that in and Megan's going to talk in a moment about a book that we actually both um were, were reading at the beginning of this year and um it's written by um Heather Younger and she talks about how psychological safety um, happens in anti-racist and anti-ableist communities and how we have to be in these opportunities to speak up and ask questions and concerns. We have to be very aware of our interpersonal dynamics and how and what we say and microaggressions that might occur and um, knowing how to um, support one another to identify when that's happened and, and work through it to figure out a way where everybody really is living in a place of psychological safety to do all of this work. We could just go to the next slide, no worries. Um, responsive leadership also appreciates the gift of feedback. I think from a system, what we really realized and um, I had to reframe my concept of, of that too, because the more that you systematically scale inclusion, the more people wanted real feedback about what our team members were doing in the classroom, how things were going. And then um, I really wanted on, and Megan and, and all of our leadership team really wanted information, data on how we can make things better. And so we created this three parts throughout the year system of feedback. And, and uh, the one at the end of the year was very comprehensive. And I cried <laughs> while I read it. And we still had every team member returning this year, right? And I knew that at that time, but just um, realizing that, that even when we, we feel like we're getting it really right, we're, there are many opportunities for us to get it even better for, especially for the people who were, who were working with, um, that was hard. And we gathered that information in, in many ways. And we started demonstrating very quickly that we were responding to their feedback. So we, you know, designed professional development based off of what they said and, agreed to change systems or processes that weren't working for them or was causing an undue amount of stress or pressure or work, um, because that's a really important piece. We have to gather information that is meaningful, and then we have to, to let the people who we lead know that what they share matters and what they share will make a difference. It's kind of that reinforcing loop, so they keep sharing because it's a gift. This is how we we keep our people and we we make sure that they love what they do and they stay engaged. Um, we've talked about how we include members in as many um, team members in as many different decisions across all of those system levels um, as we can. And I feel privileged to get questions still about, can you help me think through this ABC behavior chart? Um, you know, that everybody knows mine and Megan's and Kat's, our amazing assistant director, um, and Julie, who leads our therapy team, like our doors are always open. We want to collaborate. There is no problem. There's not a bother. We want and are doing this very much with you. Use data respectfully and carefully and to power through, not over. So we're always very um, intentional about how we share it. We're um, careful how we share it. And um, we, when we're kind of 
I guess, measuring someone's use of particular inc uh, inclusive practices and, and also in helping our teams and our practitioners understand why gathering different AEPS data are important or, you know, um, different BRS data or, or doing things to ensure that the practices we've designed are having the intended outcome are really important. It's really um, hard for practitioners to, to collect data that they, they have no use for, right? Um, and then I, I just think about this a lot, um, remembering that as exhausting as, as it can, can be, I work for my team, my team doesn't work for me. And so we need to make sure that what we have control of as leaders and that the systems um, are, are supporting our team to do the best work. And my job as a leader is to serve them and to help them do their best job, not the other way around. I just really love this next slide. I was sitting actually in a session and Robin McWilliams was talking about this um, for young children. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's relatable to adults too. Um, and it's just basically what Phil said. It's it's engagement over compliance. We don't implement inclusion. And we found this out the hard way sometimes because somebody tells us that we have to do something. We implement it because our team members are engaged. And that means that they're connected. They feel appreciated that they have this emotional and mental relationship with the work that they do. Um, they love their work. They think that working at RISE is awesome. And so they don't wanna go somewhere else. And that's how, that helps them do things like stay and work hard when we're in early childhood center who's asking them to do more than another center might do um, and to encourage one another to do the same. Um, this is the, the book that Jackie was talking about, The Art of Caring Leadership um, by Heather Younger. And we, Jackie actually had shared it with me um, and we love to catch up on it in the spare time that we have, whether it's catching each other in the bathroom and are like, hey, did you, um, you know, hear that podcast by Heather Younger or, um, you know, as, as we're dropping our children off to classes in the morning or, hey, I want to talk to you about this chapter. And so this has been a really nice, um, I would say, recentering point for us um, in terms of thinking about joyful and caring leadership. Um, we, Jackie had mentioned that I had the opportunity to share about a, a vulnerable moment where I had to hit the, the redo button um, in the last webinar. And the, while it was difficult initially to do, um, I felt really reaffirmed in, in doing it because the feedback from uh, the teaching staff was that they appreciated that moment of vulnerability and that they were able to see me acknowledge that I had made a mistake, um, do something to make it right, and then demonstrate that because of that um, mistake, I was able to really grow in the process. And so it was really reaffirming that, you know, it is okay to make these mistakes and, and acknowledge them and grow from them um, and, and demonstrate that for them as well. Um, and, and honestly, I really did grow a lot from that experience and, and how I approach collaborative teaching. Um, one of the things that that um, Heather Younger and Jackie and I talk a lot about is being able to give that one-on-one -on -one time. And I think this is one I don't want to say that I struggle with. Um, I, I do my best to make sure that, that I'm we're really creating these positive relationships with each other through this one-on-one -on -one time. But I also think it's the easiest one to be like, I don't have time for that right now. I need to focus on getting all of these things done on my to-do list and to close the door um, and just say, I just want to you know, cross a couple of things off my list or, or I have more people asking me for more help with stuff. I just need some time to get some stuff done. So um, really holding this one-on-one -on -one time is so important. And, and I want to give kudos to Jackie because um, I think this is where she really thrives. Um, she is always the first one to go to all the classrooms and just check in in the morning and, and you know, ask how they can be supported. Um, and she, we even had um, a team member that came in and said, you know, th this is the only leadership team that that's ever done that for them before. So, um, and that contributes to this 100% retention rate. 
Um, but this really is in these moments and these one-on-one -on -one times is where these real intentional uh, relationships with our coworkers happen. And so making sure that we are holding space for that. We um, really are moving away from having these, hey, how are you moments? And then going about our day. I think there's several times um, in the past where I might have walked by someone and said, you know, how are you? And their response was, yeah, okay. And I was like, oh, you know, that definitely didn't sound like you're okay, but I have a lot to do. So I'm gonna keep walking. Um, if anything, it really did damage to our relationship because it was almost a bid that I didn't respond to. Um, and so really making sure that that we're getting past these quick how are you's and, and making our moments with each other meaningful, just like we do in the classroom, right? Like we we create meaningful play opportunities and, and relationship building moments. And that's what we're trying to do for each other as well. Um, we also I do things inside and out of school together, which help build in that relationship. Um, and everyone is always invited no matter what, whether it's a happy hour or Frisbee in the park, which isn't really my space, but I know I'm always invited um, and would belong if, if I were to go. Um, but really making sure that we're using this, this model of, of joyful, caring leadership to really guide us um, in implementing and upscaling these inclusive practices. Um, and then this one, not a lot to say. I know you all can read, so I don't really want to read it through you, but these are really just the checkpoints that we commit ourselves to. Um, and I, I know Jackie's going to speak on it a little bit more here, but as we're you know really thinking about professional development, coming back to um, these, these supports specifically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so on the, the next slide, Megan and I have have and Kat and Julie and really all of our lead teach everybody I don't know every it's like everybody does it all um I just don't I don't ever want to take credit for something that other people have had a very important role in um but we've thought we've considered really thoughtfully about what are the professional development supports that our staff are saying that they need it and want from topic to way um to you know implementing and doing and the best strategy is to ask um i know megan was sharing earlier that it's been really neat to see our classrooms um improve in the inclusion practices that they're using and just how much more knowledgeable and in-depth and um really just incredible their their questions and support needs are and the things that they're reaching out now for support with are so different from the things that they were were reaching out before with um and using data not not date that's probably my my bad my probably i don't know my child probably wrote that <laughs> um to make sure that what is is being done um, is working to actually have desired outcomes because again in in early care child care settings we don't have a lot of time so we don't want to waste any precious time that we have on professional development that doesn't work and so we oftentimes will not try to teach a practice in a large group because we know it will occur better in coaching or a more one-on-one -on -one specific situation but we will take time in large group to talk about the why to to you know, bring it back to our mission and our values and what our goals are and to really um, incorporate that um, knowing of that there's a bigger picture here behind what we're doing into some of those more large group opportunities for professional development. And that also helps with buy-in and um, we have engagement and personal goals um, sometimes written out, sometimes in our heads. Um, and uh, we try to also connect professional development to the things that people say are important to them and how they want to grow and develop as well, not only related to implementing high quality inclusion, but always in some capacity bringing it back to that. We avoid blame when practices are not adopted or integrated or used with fidelity. We consider um, just the way we do for any child, like how can we better support them? How can we better teach? How can we better coach? How can we change the environment to make it work um, for our team? It normalized feeling crispy, but remain resiliency focused. So we had one of our family members come in and do a whole training on resilience where Megan has talked about our accountability buddies 
and plans. And she gave us this word to, to encourage us to reframe burnout um, and to remember burnout as though it's a cycle and everybody feels it. Everybody feels it in every job. And it's how we have planned to remain resilient, um, especially kind of in a precursor to burnout when we're kind of just feeling a little crispy instead of completely burnt. How can we take care of ourselves or ask for help to prevent us from feeling super frustrated? And while we're at it, ensure the team, ensure teams, ensure that teams have the things, um, the other things that they need to be successful. And, you know, sometimes just that they have something that they want um, <laughs> to be successful too. Uh, I have one more slide um, and just circling back to that why that we've talked about so much. Um, I think it's Google who has a study that shows that one of the best predictors of engagement and staying at your job is knowing that what you do is important. And I constantly tell our team how much what they do is important to our families and particularly to my family. And I've heard Alyssa do it and I love to hear her talk about how important our field is. And I've heard Phil and so many presentations by reminding the people who are in the room that you know, early care and learning practitioners and, and those of us who have the opportunity to lead them have the most important job in the world. And I take, and all of us take every opportunity that we have to shout that from the rooftops and remind people that what they're doing makes a really big difference. Inclusion has been the beacon of hope for our family, but it's also been the reason why we have such an amazing quality of life and that we hold and maintain high hopes and dreams and goals for our daughter, uh, Juniper, and also our daughter, Goldie, um, who doesn't have disabilities. And it's also um, why my daughter with a disability is happy and confident and thriving. And it's how we're going to get a world of magnolias who will grow up um, extending and expanding ideas like she has as a four-year-old that she hopes that when she in her classroom grows up, everyone understands Junie, who is my daughter, just like, like they do. So um, that would be the biggest takeaway. Just remember to remind yourself and everybody else that what they're doing is life or death changing um, many lives of kids and families in the community in the future. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, it's been really fun. <laughs> Jackie and Megan, thank you so much. Um, I love this idea of um, leadership from this place of communal care and caring for one another um, in order to ensure that um, everybody in the community is moving forward and to be truly inclusive. We appreciate your time. Um, we appreciate all of you who have joined us on this three-part webinar series. Um, and we look forward to hearing um, more from you again soon. All right, thank you so very much to our panelists for their wonderful insights. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar with our post-webinar survey by typing the web address shown on this slide into your internet browser or scan the QR code. Your certificate of attendance will appear once you submit the survey. We invite you to visit our website, challengingbehavior.org, to sign up for our upcoming webinars, access recordings, download pyramid model resources, and more. Thank you to our funder for making this webinar possible. This concludes our webinar. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.